Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our consideration this morning is our epistle lesson, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. After, of course, Jesus, I would personally say that David might be the most fascinating person in the Bible. There's, there's so much about David that's interesting. You know, he was the he was the young shepherd boy who defeated a giant with just a slingshot and a stone. He then became the great king, the greatest king that Israel ever had, the warrior king, who expanded Israel's territory to, to an all-time high, who was who was truly a man of God, a man who was, was after God's own heart, a man that God loved for his, his spirituality. But there's a whole other side to David, too, and this is what makes him so fascinating. For all his being a great warrior king, David also had tremendous weaknesses. For one, he had once just been one shepherd boy the youngest brother to two brothers who all seemed more impressive than he did, at least to the prophet Samuel. David was tormented by King Saul. Again and again, Saul tried to have David killed, forcing David to, to flee out into the desert. David, I suppose most infamously, we remember for his one great two great sins, committing adultery with Bathsheba, and then having Bathsheba's husband murdered so that he could have Bathsheba for himself. David was also more or less an abject failure as a father, to the point that one of his sons even led a rebellion against him, forcing David to once again flee out into the desert. And so when you keep all of David's biography in mind, it shouldn't surprise us that David once wrote, I am worn out from my groaning. I flood my bed all night long with my tears. I drench my couch. My eyes are blurred by sorrow. They are worn out because of all my faults. When you look at, at, at David with fully open eyes, he's maybe not such a great hero. But that's how it goes with heroes, right? It seems like there aren't any more heroes, or perhaps there never were. For many young people, especially young boys, their, their heroes are professional athletes. And then as you get older, you realize how ridiculous it is to think of an adult who gets paid a ridiculous amount of money to play a game while also taking performance-enhancing drugs. To play that game, how ridiculous it is to look at that person as a hero. There's nothing provoked about that. Much of my generation grew up thinking of Bill Cosby as the perfect father. He was the dad of the 80s. And we couldn't have been more wrong. It doesn't seem like there are heroes. Now, there are certainly other figures in the Bible we would think of, perhaps, as heroes. Again, obviously, Jesus. After Jesus, probably the apostles, with perhaps Paul at the top of that list. Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. But it's interesting to note what what Paul says about his, his heroism, about his strength here in our, our lesson from his, his second letter to the Corinthians. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And so with Paul we pray, Lord, make me weak. 
Our first question would be, or should be, what in the world is Paul talking about? I am weak, Paul says. Weak? This is Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. Obviously, I suppose one could have an argument about that, but it sure seems like he'd be a leading contender for that. Traveled all over the Roman Empire, including even getting to Spain. Planted many, many churches. First spoke the gospel to so many people. People were introduced to Jesus. People had faith planted in their hearts through the words that Paul spoke. And not only did Paul plant churches, he continued to nurture them, came back and visited them, wrote them letters. Speaking of letters, Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. If Paul isn't a hero, who would qualify as a hero, especially to us Christians? And yet, just like David, just like professional athletes, when you look more closely, there's a lot of weakness with Paul. Remember, originally he had been a persecutor of the church. He killed Christians for being Christian. And then, you know, the true hero, Jesus, came down and turned his life completely around, changed him, made him an apostle, made him a missionary. But there's a lot of weakness in Paul's missionary journeys. Five different times, Paul was whipped with 39 lashes. Three times he was imprisoned. He was stoned and left for dead. He was beaten. He was persecuted all over the place. Even some of the people that he had brought to the faith doubted his apostleship. People doubted whether or not Paul really was an apostle. There's also, a Paul also make, makes references to himself as not being a very good speaker. That's fascinating. Isn't it? To think of the, the greatest missionary of all time, the Apostle Paul, as not being very good at, at speaking publicly. Many pastors have taken comfort <laughs> in that thought. Paul was weak. But yet, just like David, there's two sides to the story. Paul also in some sense, was a hero. Had many great blessings and strengths. And one of the greatest blessings, a really unique blessing Paul received, uh, is, is referred to right before our blessing. It was the, the, this tremendous blessing that caused Paul to perhaps be tempted to be arrogant. And this blessing was that Paul received a vision of heaven. He got to see what heaven was like. And it was so intense that he wasn't even really sure if it was just a vision or if he had actually been taken up to heaven for a while, outside of his, of his body. But the temptation then for Paul was to be arrogant about having seen heaven. I think we could probably relate to that. It might be tempting to... Think of oneself as being a little bit better than all the, all the other people who've never seen heaven. And so Paul explains to us how Jesus addressed that potential problem of, of Paul becoming arrogant. Therefore, to keep me from becoming arrogant, um, literally to keep me from exalting myself, due to the extraordinary nature of these revelations, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not become arrogant. Of all of Paul's weaknesses, this is the most famous or infamous. Partly because we don't know for sure what it is. It's clear that it was bad, that it was humbling, that it was also even a detriment to his ministry. It made his work as a proclaimer of the gospel more difficult. There are various theories about what it was, and a lot of them make a lot of sense. One is, is that Paul contracted malaria while he was working in the lowlands of Asia Minor. His first mission work was in that area of 
place notorious for uh, mosquitoes and, and malaria. Certainly possible. Uh, one of my favorites is because, again, it's hard to know always the correct use of the word irony, but it seems ironic. The theory that Paul had a speech impediment. I find that fascinating. Again, to think of the, the Apostle Paul having a speech impediment and doing mission work. We can't rule out the possibility of, of direct demonic influence, that, that demons, Satan himself, were tormenting him, torturing him, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, perhaps even. What we do know is that it was bad. No joke. Remember, Paul's a tough dude. I, I laid out all the, all the physical persecution he faced, but he endured it. He kept going. This was a tough guy. But this particular thorn in his flesh, this messenger from Satan, was so bad that Paul begged Jesus three different times to take it away. There's a couple of really important things we should, we should learn. From. Number one, that's not a bad thing to do. If you have something bad in your life, and you ask God, you pray to Jesus to take it away, and he doesn't, it's not a bad thing to go to him again, and again, and again. That's not being disrespectful. In fact, God wants us to do that. It makes him happy when we turn to him with our problems and ask for his assistance. But it's also important to notice that it seems as if Paul stopped asking eventually. He came to accept it. Because Jesus' answer was no. Jesus' answer was no, I'm not, I'm not going to take this away. And Paul came to accept it. In fact, he did more than just accept it. He said, I will be glad to boast all the more in my weaknesses. He says, I delight in weaknesses. That's a hard one to wrap your mind around, isn't it? We can, we can maybe understand, okay, Paul came to accept it and endure it, but to delight in it, to boast about it, that's not how things work, right? We don't delight in weaknesses. A weak bridge falls. A weak leader doesn't get anything done. A weak athlete never gets off the bench. In our experience, strength is good Weakness is bad. So how could Paul delight in this weakness that, that Jesus did not take away from Paul? How could he boast about it? Well, the answer, of course, is in what Jesus said to him. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect. I like another translation, but better, I'll make it complete. My power is made complete in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect or complete in weakness. Paul recognized that the attention needed to be on Jesus instead of him. So when Jesus allowed Paul to have these weaknesses, and yet Jesus still worked through Paul and accomplished great things, well then the attention would be on Jesus. If Paul really had a speech impediment, it would be pretty hard to credit Paul as being the one who converted people. If Paul was not a very good speaker, clearly those conversions were coming from something, from someone else. The power behind Paul. The power of Jesus. Paul says, I will be glad to boast all the more in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may shelter me. You might remember the old NIV translation, but the power of Christ may dwell in me. Not bad. I like shelter even better. Shelter paints the picture of Christ's power surrounding Paul, sheltering him and protecting him. But Paul could say, as he does here, when I am weak, then I am strong. But he could only say that because first he could say, when I am weak, then Christ's 
is strong. When I am weak, it's clear to everyone that it's someone else who's accomplishing these great things. Christ is strong. But if Christ is strong, then so is God. When I am weak, then I am strong. We all, of course, have weaknesses. I'm reminded of, of my weaknesses every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning. I'm sure you have many times in an average week when you're reminded of things you're not good at. When you're reminded of weaknesses in your personality and your, in your, in your knowledge, weaknesses in your, your stamina. And it's not a bad thing to pray to get stronger in those areas. It's not bad. But it's also a good thing to pray, Lord, make me weak. Make me weak, Lord, so that your power and your glory may shine all the brighter instead of me getting attention. Like Paul, we can delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties for the sake of Christ. Lord, give me illnesses. Not because I want to suffer, but because when you do so, Lord, then I will turn to you. Give me hardship. Not because I will enjoy that, but because when you do so, then I'm forced to turn to you because it's so clear that my strength isn't enough. I need your strength, Jesus. Only you can save me. Only you can protect me. Lord, we delight in weaknesses and hardships. I don't have to tell you that not everything goes perfectly at Divinity Lutheran Church. Sometimes we try our best, and despite our best intentions, we fall flat on our faces, and things don't work out quite the way we want them to. But then other tremendous blessings just get dropped in our lap. And isn't that better? If our work always succeeded, if we always thrived in all the things that we chose to do, the ways we implemented, wouldn't we be tempted, as Paul was, to become arrogant, to exalt ourselves? Isn't it much better that sometimes we fall on our faces, and then through no effort of our own, through nothing we've done, tremendous blessings are showered upon us as individuals and as congregants? Because then it's more clear to us. This is God. This is Jesus. This isn't me. This isn't us. It's not our intelligence and our plans. It's purely God blessing our efforts. You see, when we are weak, then we are strong. Strong in Christ. When the shepherd boy went up against the giant, he said, I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of armies, of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And he's going to hand you over to me. David could speak with that kind of confidence to a giant because his confidence was in God, not in And we can say, along with David as he did later, the Lord is the protector of his people. He is the fortress of salvation. He is the one who shelters us with his power and makes us strong, even when we are weak. Amen.